All right, so we start four minutes late, but uh, I shall give Ramesh an extra four minutes. Um, so welcome to this uh, Wednesday seminar, folks. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Mr. Ramesh Balakrishnan, who, uh, quite unlike our usual crowd here, our usual set of speakers here, is an engineer. Uh, you know, we social scientists. Oh, by the way, our photographer is also an engineer. So uh, may the strive, strive increase. We need more engineers in social sciences and more social scientists in engineering. Uh, so um, he is going to be talking to us about China's cyber juggernaut. Uh, and uh, for those of you a little familiar with English words, you know that the word juggernaut comes from as is Indian in origin, right? From Lord Jagannath of course. in Orissa. So, um, there you have it. You already have an Indian connection right there. Uh, Ramesh is an engineer, but he has an interest in, uh, in cyber issues, and he's doing this uh, from a perspective that interests us, which is social sciences, he's not going to give go all technical on us, I hope. Yeah. And actually he has a very social scientist uh, approach, you see the very, very long s subtitle. That's, uh, that's a weakness that we social scientists have, long titles and long subtitles. Uh, I hope none of you will be phased by this. I'm sure he's going to have enough and more to tell us that is interesting. Um, I will not pretend to understand or give you a forward to what he's going to say. I will leave it to ja uh, Ramesh and then if wisdom dawns, I shall maybe some try and summarize a bit at the end of the presentation. <coughs> so you've got about 40 minutes um, and this is an interesting topic so if anybody falls asleep in between, I shall call you out. Very few people and I know everybody by name. So. Except you, ma'am, sorry. <laughs> uh, but I guess you're sitting right at the front, so you, there's no danger there. Over to you, Ramesh. So from 3.05 to about 3.40. Thank you, Krishna. Okay, thank you, Jamin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present today. Um, this is a topic that I've been thinking about for a while, so let me just uh, set this in context and give you a little bit of background to this uh, particular discussion. So this is... Uh, topic that I've been thinking about for a while. I just completed a, a research internship at uh, the Observer Research Foundation, um, where I used to see, uh, used to go over there quite, quite often. <laughs> um, um, and uh, I worked at the, uh, the Cyber uh, Security Initiative, which is a, a fairly large initiative within uh, ORF um, on um, cyber security issues. And uh, one of the things I looked at was um, India's uh, uh, role in the in the international cyber internet order, if you will, in terms of how India is positioning itself and uh, what are the kinds of constraints and issues that India faces um, in terms of uh, its role in um, cyber governance. So that was my area of work, and I did some uh, research on it. And there's, there's a occasional paper that's going to come out uh, probably by the end of this uh, month. Uh, but the, then, as, while I was doing research on that, I kind of got interested in China, and I was um, and. I've been studying a little bit about China's uh, cyber strategies over the years, but uh, never really got to kind of uh, understanding, you know, what exactly, um, why is China behaving in this fashion. Um, so in this particular presentation, um, I'm not going to get into what is what what China is uh, um, is actually doing in cyberspace. Um, you know, we all know about. Uh, I think uh, we're all uh, you know in, in the you know uh, Chinese sphere of uh, study. So. Um, there is broad knowledge, there's a lot of information available you know, outside um, in the media about Chinese behavior in cyberspace in terms of what they're doing, they're ex they are involved in extensive cyber espionage and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, news that goes out uh, you know, every day about um, uh, the, the extent of uh, information controls within the Chinese society, uh, the Chinese, the Great Firewall and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to get into those aspects of it. But I think what I'm going to kind of focus on is um, a lot of what you're seeing in terms of behavior is um, a result of what, um, at least in this uh, particular paper, is what I've conceptualized in terms of how China um, uh, approaches cyber power. Um, and then I'm going to contrast that with how India approaches cyber power. Um, and once we get a 
fairly good understanding of how they kind of approach the concept of the conceptualization of cyber power, um, then you get an uh, idea of how they exercise that power, um, how they mobilize cyber power, and then they exercise that power. And a lot of the behavior that you're seeing is essentially a manifestation of how they exercise cyber power in, in, in cyberspace. Um, so all the cyber strategies, all of the things that, they, that China and India are doing currently, um, essentially flows out of those ideas or basic conceptualizations of how the state or the actors within the state or, or the, the policy makers, decision makers um, conceptualize cyber power. So, that's, so I'm going to focus almost entirely on cyber power and cyber capabilities. Um, and I'm going to leave the things like in terms of cyber strategies and so on as a kind of a, um, you know, things that fall out of that. Um, um, so I'm going to um, uh, start off with give you, giving you a definition of, you know, cyber power and how cyber power is conceptualized by these two states and how um, they, they, they kind of, uh, you know, um, look at cyber power from a, from a state perspective. Um, and I'm going to kind of uh, in, uh, talk about three critical factors that I have kind of come up with in terms of, um, you know, as a hypothesis in terms of why they conceptualize cyber power in that fashion. Um, and uh, some of these factors are internal to the state and some of these factors are external factors. And then I'm going to talk about specific aspects of strategic behavior uh, that China and India exhibit in cyberspace. Um, and then I'm going to kind of conclude with some regional implications as to what exactly does it mean for Asia as a whole, uh, with these two states um, looking at cyber in such so diametrically different uh, different ways? Um, so before I begin, I just want to give you a kind of a high-level overview of the state of the internet in these two countries today, in terms of um, the uh, in terms of usage of uh, internet and how internet has grown. Of course, China had a um, kind of a head start in this field, uh, uh, probably at least a ten years um, ahead of India in terms of how the internet has grown. Uh, but of course, India has um, caught up quite a bit in the last, I would say, five to six years in terms of um, making available the internet to uh, large segments of its population. Um, and um, <coughs> what we are seeing in terms of um, broad metrics, um, they're very quite comparable. I mean, five years ago, if you had looked at these metrics, they were, they were kind of completely skewed towards um, China. But now I think what you're seeing is increasingly that India is catching up. Um, there's a lot more internet um, users. Uh, more online shoppers. I think uh, by 2020, there will probably be more than 100, 120 uh, million online shoppers in India. That number is rapidly growing. Um, we are also seeing uh, the, uh, the number of mobile internet users growing as well. And uh, and the, the 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 one area where I think there's a big contrast is the number of domain names that are registered. Uh, China is growing very quickly, particularly the .c and domain name is growing very quickly, and whereas India is still not at the, in the same level in terms of domain names. But I think with e-commerce growing in India, you're going to see more and more companies um, you know, register domain names in the future. <coughs> um, the one major contrast that you see between India and China is that um, the top visited websites um, in India are all uh, belong to the multinationals, um, particularly the US multinationals, Facebook, Google, Twitter. These are the top visited websites in India. Whereas in China, it's just the exact opposite. Um, all of the companies that are, some of these companies that are mentioned there, Tencent, Baidu, these are the companies that are the the, the top, um, you know, visited websites for obvious reasons because, you know, Western companies can't set up uh, a shop in, in China. I think Google did set up shop and then they were asked to leave after some time. Um, so that gives you a kind of an overview of, um, I just want to set this as a kind of a, um, an initial kind of a contextual kind of a slide so that you get an idea of the state of internet in these two countries. Um, it's, it, it was, I think, uh, uh, as I said, it was uh, skewed towards China, but now I think we are seeing a lot more balance in, in terms of uh, how the internet uh, evolves in these two places. And uh, this slide essentially tells you how the how the, the gap that existed between the US, India, and China in terms of how the internet um, essentially started and how it kind of evolved. Um, and what you see is that um, kind of the S-curve, the inverted S-curve um, at, at different phases. So in other words, the US uh, essentially started in the 90s and then China and India essentially started around the same time. Maybe um, India even earlier is, is at least this curve is, you know, the, the ones that I see here, which is 1995. Um, but then you see that uh, China rapidly takes off around 2005 and the Indian um, internet growth starts around 2009 or so. Um, so, um, 
but there's a lot more growth ahead uh, in terms of where the where the internet is uh, is going in the future in both these countries. Um, so this slide kind of captures the kind of contrasting behavior that these two countries, um, you know, exhibit in cyberspace. Um, and I have kind of taken some um, key parameters to kind of study how these two countries look at or how they kind of behave in cyberspace in terms of what they're doing. Um, um, in terms of cyber espionage, as, as I started, I mentioned in the start, uh, when, when we started this presentation, uh, that uh, there is a lot of public available information about the kinds of cyber espionage that China is engaged in. Um, in fact, it's widely documented, it's out there. And uh, uh, primarily for commercial, um, you know, espionage for commercial purposes um, is, what, um, is, is what increasingly the evidence that we gather, we find that that's where China is. I mean, they are of course in, in engaging in a lot of other cyber attacks and so on against uh, organizations, NGOs, and things like that. But I'm kind of, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not consequential for the state because it doesn't really build state capacity in any way. Whereas uh, cyber espionage really matters a lot because it, it means that they're able to exfiltrate, uh, you know, intellectual property of uh, companies and so on and so forth. So that is of some value to the state. Um, um, and that also impacts military modernization as well. Um, in terms of the military cyber strategy, what you find is that um, while um, the recent uh, Chinese military strategy that was uh, uh, put out last year, I think, um, identifies active defense as one of the strategic guidance which the which the party has actually um, you know um, given to the to the PLA. In other words, um, active defense is a much more um, uh, I would say an advanced uh, cyber strategy than pure uh, defense because active defense essentially means that. Um, you are taking very active steps in cyberspace in real time uh, to not only defend yourself but also be ready enough, um, you know, be um, almost in a trigger um, kind of a um, uh, phase where you can actually launch um, quite substantial cyber attacks at very short notice. So active defenses are much more, uh, um, you know, in, in nuclear terms, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost like keeping your, uh, you know, nuclear weapons uh, mated with your uh, missiles or whatever. So, so there is that there is a very, very active um, component to it, um, which are, in other words, they are not going to launch cyber attacks after something happens. Whereas India is still very much in a passive defense mode at this point in time, in terms of uh, the military cyber strategies. Uh, um, the national IT strategy at a very high level, uh, the basic difference is that China treats the internet as a strategic asset. And that means a lot because if you, when you treat it as a strategic national asset, it has a lot. The connotation is very different. Whereas in India, um, the 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 state looks at in the internet primarily as a socio-economic development tool. In other words, the state hasn't really declared that the internet is a strategic asset. Um, you know, it has it has essentially said that it is a it is a tool for bringing um, internet access. Um, equity, internet equity for uh, millions of uh, Indian citizens so that they, the, the benefits of the internet for commercial purposes as well as for socio-economic development is broadly available to large segments of the population. So that's, there's another big difference there. In terms of technology policy and strategy that the state pursues, um, in India it's more what I call as a handmaiden approach. Uh, very much in the political economy literature, you know, in India over the last 15-20 years, a lot of political economists have essentially come up with this term um, who study technology policy at least. That uh, the Indian approach is more like the state essentially um, essentially has retreated from uh, determining um, strategy. You know, they do still kind of come up with technology policies, but they don't kind of, um, you know, impose any kind of strategic mandates on the private sector or any other companies for that matter. Whereas in China, it's a much more custodial approach where the state um, engages in technology determinism. It it, it kind of uh, market the, it guides the market in a certain direction um, in terms of the steps that they need to get, take in order to get to the objectives that they need to meet. Whereas in India, it's uh, essentially you know there, there are no broad objectives, long term objectives in terms of what what needs to get done. And the cyber capabilities, we all know that China is very very strong on the hardware side um, of uh, technology, and whereas uh, India is India is much stronger on the software side. Um, uh, but cyber capabilities, I think uh, um, China is catching up a lot on the software side as well. Um, and in terms of internet surveillance monitoring, which is something that is widely discussed in the media with regard to China, um, 
what you find is that in India there is monitoring going on. There's something called a central monitoring system that I think uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs or one of the ministries actually deploys to monitor the internet. But um, I think from the evidence that we find, it's primarily to prevent any terrorist attacks. Um, so it's very much centered around um, preventing large-scale terrorism and to kind of monitor uh, you know, suspects or whatever in space, in, in, uh, in uh, cyberspace. Whereas in China, what you find it's it's more about maintaining internal social order, and it's got broader ramifications in terms of censorship, in terms of what you can say, what you can't say, and so on and so forth. So there's a so 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 what you find is that there's a almost a um, fundamental uh, huge difference in the way these the state these two states actually um, you know understand and, and behave in cyberspace. And so I'm trying to figure out um, what accounts for this vast difference in in the way these two states are. And uh, uh, you know, look at look, look at such space. And the argument uh, that I have uh, essentially is that such puzzle is essentially um, um, goes down to how these states conceptualize cyber power. Um, you know, because all of these things that you see in terms of the cyber strategies, the cyber behavior, is all a manifestation of how the state itself looks at cyber power and how it conceptualizes cyber power. Because it's very easy to understand nuclear power. You know. States have nuclear weapons, they have delivery mechanisms, they have a huge uh, nuclear infrastructure, it's all controlled by the state. Um, but cyber power is, is, is a very different concept. It's still an evolving idea. You know, people are still trying to understand what cyber power really is and what does it really mean. Because it traverses both the civilian domain as well as the military domain. Unlike nuclear weapons, <laughs> which are essentially a state-controlled entity, where the state has all the resources, it employs all the scientists, all the knowledge, um, you know, the civilians hardly are, are you know, are, get to know what's going on. So it's, it's a very secretive kind of a thing that happens within the state. Whereas cyber is out in the open. You know, every person uses uh, technology. Um, it's, it traverses both the civilian and military domain. So there is a, the, 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 the conceptualization of cyber power is still a new idea. It's still getting a lot of, uh, um, you know, new academic, I think the academics are increasingly looking at it and trying to understand what exactly does it mean for a state. Uh, so it's still a very evolving concept, um, but I think the the basic uh, once the state conceptualizes um, or understands what cyber power really means from their from their perspective, then they go about actually mobilizing it. Um, you know, um, and some of them, some states like China or Russia, actually actively engage in mobilizing power, cyber power, whereas states like India are not, or they don't have a kind of a coherent enough um, approach to actively seek and go out and seek and aggrandize cyber power. Um, because of the structure of the state and the way our state, the state operates. And then of course, then you exercise cyber power and that's essentially what we are seeing in terms of cyber behavior. So in, in, so in this presentation, I'm, my focus as I said is primarily on trying to oh, uh, give you a fairly uh, you know, uh, high level understanding of how, why, how these states conceive the, the concept of cyber power and how they actually use it. Uh, so before that, let me just give you a little bit of a, a quick review of the, the why cyber is becoming such a contested space. Um, because um, um, there's a there's a lot of contest in cyberspace, uh, primarily because um, you know states want to dominate. Um, in other words, uh, because the U.S. is the uh, country where the internet was born, uh, where the internet has grown over the years, uh, the U.S. seeks some kind of a dominance in cyberspace uh, to the extent that they would like to deny uh, cyberspace in times of um, say um, contest, or contestation, or conflict. Um, where they can deny that cyberspace to an adversary. So, so uh, they want to develop dominance and capabilities. And states like China, Russia are in the same um, essential uh, you know, phase of looking at cyber as well. And they would like to dominate um, you know, cyberspace as well, but unfortunately they don't control all the elements that go into, into, into cyber power. Um, so um, because of the nature of cyber and the fact that it's a contested space, it's becoming a more and more a contested space because um, there's a lot of things going on. Um, you know, there's the dark web where there's a lot of uh, illegal cyber activity that goes on. Uh, there's uh, um, enormous amount of um, you know um, uh, issues with the with, with the internet in terms of how the internet is governed. There's a not, not a lot of states are happy with it. India, China, uh, because the U.S. Uh, dominates, uh, you know, all of the forums that essentially control governance and rules that the rule making and norm shaping that happens in the in cyberspace. So it's becoming a more and more a contested space for uh, uh, for these reasons. So um, 
as I explained, the, the conceptualization needs to uh, leads to um, the mobilization of power and then the exercise of power, which ultimately leads to uh, you know the uh, the national uh, cyber security strategies that these states come up with. Um, the mobilization of cyber power ha happens at two levels. One is what I call as hard power, and the other is soft power. Um, hard power is essentially uh, all of the um, elements of the technology that goes into the making of the internet and all the um, you know, devices that are connected to the internet, uh, which is essentially the networks, the devices, computing, computing devices, um, you know, chips, um, computer chips, um, you know, all of the uh, plumbing and all the infrastructure, the real physical infrastructure that makes up the internet. Um, and the, the root servers, which are the essential servers that the US uh, controls have about 11 root servers, which essentially manage all of the domain names and the uh, IP addresses of uh, all of the global traffic in terms of where the internet uh, you know, um, traffic flows are, are concerned. And the US has complete control over these servers. Um, and they can, they, because they manage the, it's like a phone book uh, where they manage all the IP addresses and all of this. So it's like, think of it like having, um, you know, because uh, the telephone network, you have phone books nationally for every country. For the internet, there's one global phone book and that phone book is within in the hands of the United States. So other countries essentially are dependent on them for uh, you know managing and updating it and so on and so forth. So um, hard power, how do you acquire hard power in, that, in those kinds of scenarios? Um, and soft power essentially um, includes a whole uh, range of things including um, you know internet companies, um, civil society groups, think tanks, uh, non-state actors and all that. So, so states go about actually mobilizing it in kind of very concerted ways. Um, and China is currently you know, in a phase where they are um, doing both. They are trying to um, you know, build hard power uh, through the capabilities that they have currently, which I'm going to kind of uh, you know, show Sorry, you. I, I, I can follow the global phone, phone book. Yeah. What is that? Um, so basically, it's the uh, uh, whenever you go and click on your web uh, to get a web address, that uh, information uh, goes to a central root server, um, you know, sitting somewhere in the US, uh, controlled by a company called VeriSign, uh, which actually then directs that particular thing and identifies your particular IP address of your device and then uh, directs you to that particular uh, website. And this happens every time everybody goes on the web and uh, on, the, on, the, on your browser and puts in a uh, web ID. Uh, you know any ID like uh, this CNN. One com place. or whatever. Yeah, there's, there's one. It's one. It's one central location. Actually, it's about eleven or twelve yeah, servers. One. Yeah, one company actually one does, company it. does it. Yes, and which is contracted with the U.S. government. So they do all of this on a regular basis. Every time anybody does it, and, and the U.S. government actually pays them for uh, this purpose for uh, through a contract to perform this function. And the name of the company is. It's called Verisign. Verisign. Yeah. Is there a company which is owned by the Symantec now? Four years back. Um, I don't think VeriSign is still an independent company. But they have a common logo now. They have a common? Common logo. Symantec changed the logo and it is now VeriSign Symantec. VeriSign Symantec. Possibly they took over, I'm not sure. Symantec. Uh, Symantec yeah. is a company that makes uh, antivirus and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, so hard power and soft power are, um, you know, both part of, uh, you know, cyber lingo these days because um, increasingly states are trying to um, accumulate both at the same time because um, and the reason why states are doing it essentially is to gain a bigger say in global governance of the internet and also to kind of build the capabilities internally um, you know within the state itself there was going to be a change to in very sign that is where chinese came in they wanted to have their own company controlling their own uh, addresses but anyway, for that, we'll, okay, come to the okay. we'll come back to that. Yeah, the That's Chinese are trying to actually build a, I think the long run, they would like to build a parallel internet. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think that's, I think, still far, far away. They are in the meantime trying to figure out how to kind of enhance their uh, position within the existing uh, mm. global, um, you know, internet structure that exists today. Because the structure, it has taken almost 30 years to put together this and we have 6 billion users using the internet right now. So how do you kind of create something um, on, the, on that scale, like, you know, and how do you attract other countries and so on? I mean, that's a big question. And I so and, uh, said that uh, there was a conference last month, uh, which actually went into the whole issue. And there was an agreement that the web addresses could be decentralized and they would not remain with the very sign. Uh, but anyways, I thought that, sorry. Yeah, it, there, there yeah. is a... Um, there we can have the discussion afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, so, um, 
the uh, if you look at the national uh, you know cyber security framework this is a kind of a thing that i put together some time back uh, just to kind of understand the different um, um, you know things that you know uh, factors that are influencing um, cyber strategy national cyber strategy and um, one of the things that i understood was at the bottom is where you see the conception and the construction of cyber power because that has a big role in trying to shape uh, you know, cyber strategy at a very high level because there's a civilian uh, part of it and the military part of it as well. And uh, the cyber strategy of any state has to encompass both these elements because you can't just uh, look at cyber purely from a civilian perspective. You also have to understand uh, what impact it's got for the, for the military because the technologies that you use are essentially the same. They're dual-use technologies. So the same uh, antivirus software that you uh, build for a civilian computer, you could use it in the military context as well. So it's not that different. So, so the because of the dual use nature of cyber, um, you know that that, that these uh, these both of these entities have to be taken into account in coming up with any kind of a national cyber strategy. But this um, diagram I put in the context of this presentation because um, there are three things here that I'm going to kind of dwell in deep in, in get, get into a little deeper. One is um, the factors actually that influence this uh, the the uh, the conceptualization of cyber power is, is what I'm going to get into later in this presentation. Um, so this slide kind of gives you a, a fairly good idea of the comparative cyber capabilities that are there with the different countries. Uh, you know, and uh, what you find, of course, the US has pretty much all of those capabilities right now. Um, and, and those are very strong capabilities. And then you look at the other countries which are um, and I put kind of uh, the countries which are probably the, the big IT, um, you know, uh, com countries that have big IT capabilities um, in some way or shape, uh, form or shape. Um, and where you find India lacking, essentially India is strong in software services uh, right now, you know, um, as from an IT perspective. Um, but there's, uh, there's some um, capabilities in, in terms of enterprise software, which is just starting. Uh, uh, product uh, uh, software for that can be built out of India, and then you have um, some internet software products also coming out uh, right now. Uh, there are uh, messaging products. There's a messaging application called Hike, which is just uh, getting a little bit of uh, traction right now. Um, but what you find is that um, other countries have very different kinds of capabilities. Now, as far as China is concerned. Um, China has some ch capabilities in manufacturing chips, but it's still a very weak capability. They don't have, um, you know, they've been investing in that for quite a long time, but um, if you look at the actual capabilities on the ground in terms of what they can actually produce, it's not, a, not, not, not very uh, expansive at this point in time. Of course, they have a very strong capabilities in mobile and computer hardware. Um, some uh, strong capabilities in internet products, because all these companies that you see in terms of Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, all these companies are essentially come out of internet products that, that have been built. Software services, they're not there at all. Um, they are very strong networking hardware, as you know, uh, telecom equipment companies coming out of China. But in cloud software, enterprise software platforms, China doesn't have much of a uh, presence, really. Um, and then, of course, countries like Japan, Korea, they all have different um, uh, capabilities at, at different uh, um, levels in different areas. So for India, cyber security software products is, uh, and uh, capabilities in uh, cloud software, enterprise software, can essentially increase India's basic capabilities in that area because what you find is that there is uh, um, a substantial amount of work going on in, the, in these areas right now. And there's some product companies that are coming up. So those are the areas where India would essentially start to focus on. Because hardware is something that, um, that I think India missed the bus and I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I don't think you're going to see large-scale chip manufacturing or networking hardware companies coming out of India anytime soon in the near future. I think that I don't think the government at least is, is not looking at it either in a big way. So, um, so the the approach, the you know, the approach to cyber power essentially is twofold. Um, um, how states look at it. Um, one is um, some states like China look at it as a strategic asset, um, which basically means that um, they have. Um, um, you know, capabilities that are, um, you know, spent across different areas. Um, there's, uh, um, they are engaging in, um, you know, um, a lot of surveillance. They are doing, um, you know, espionage. So they are, they look at it primarily as a strategic asset. Um, but countries like India look at it as a crown jewel. And what I mean by crown jewel is essentially is that something that needs to be protected. Um, 
It's not to be leveraged for launching um, something against a third country, but something that needs to be protected for your own, um, um, you know, uh, welfare and for the for, for your own socio-economic development within the, within the country, rather than being used as a strategic tool. Um, and so. Um, I think I've discussed this a little bit before uh, in terms of the military strategy, um, in terms of cyberspace dominance um, and countries that are doing it currently and uh, you know the, the countries like India which want to profess coexistence um, in cyberspace. So I'm going to kind of skip, skip that. Um, and I did discuss the nuclear analogy as well. Um, the fact that uh, nuclear is an area where uh, uh, the state essentially uh, you know manages all the resources, uh, manages the scientific pool. Whereas in um, in the cyber domain, the state does not. In fact, it has no so, so capabilities. All of the capabilities in the cyber domain exist outside the state. So, in other words, in, within the private sector, uh, within the uh, uh, non uh, what what we call as non-state actors, um, people who are engaged in hacking and people who are engaged in uh, you know building uh, antivirus software and so on, they're all outside of the government labs. Um, so you're not going to see something like a BARC or something in, in cyber. You know, there's, um, so it's, 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 it's a very different uh, entity altogether. And the state essentially is retreated, doesn't really get in that much into, um, you know, wanting to put, uh, you know, resources into it at this point in time. Um, because all the capabilities exist, so why do you, there's no point in recreating, uh, you know, expertise within the government. So the government has to essentially rely on non-state actors, which is something very new for states. Uh, because a, a state like India, for example, you know, um, there's a, you know, if you look at the missile uh, complex and the nuclear complex, the space complex, they're all large, you know, um, state-governed and state uh, resource-funded entities. It's a lot easier to, you know, figure out policy and so on. But in cyber, because there's nothing like that, there's no equivalent of an ISRO in cyber. Uh, you know, so so what you are what you have to do is essentially is to rely on outside uh, help and outside expertise. And how do you kind of mobilize that? I think that's a big question that I think uh, India, is, India needs to answer because there's, that's something that is a completely new area uh, for bureaucrats, for uh, policymakers. You know, how do you kind of uh, use capabilities from outside you know, for your own, for the, for the in welfare of the state, for the, so that the state can use it? <clears throat> um, so the three factors that I wanted to talk about essentially are the um, um, issues with regard to um, three things. Um, that essentially influence cyber behavior or, or the conceptualization of cyber power. One is the political order that exists in these two states. Two is the technology strategy uh, that these states are pursuing. And three is the strategic environment in which these states are operating. So these are the three um, 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 that I argue that are fundamentally driving their conceptualization of cyber power and all of the things that you see in terms of cyber strategies that come out of it. And, um, and, and these three, um, you know, uh, factors are are also kind of um, um, enabling them to kind of figure out how to um, um, build the capabilities over a period of time, particularly technology strategy, because the te technology strategies ultimately um, leads to the kind of capability building over a period of time, and and um, you know because that's the only dynamic and um, uh, technology strategy and strategic environment are the two dynamic things. Political order is fairly a stable thing, you know. Political order doesn't really change day to day, so it's not something that's that states can deal with. It's something that's a given. So you have to deal with it as it exists. Whereas technology strategy is something that's in, in the control of the state. It can keep changing it. It can uh, modify it. It can bring in new things. Uh, and the strategic environment, of course, is also the security dynamics are constantly changing. Um, so in terms of uh, Chinese interest in cyberspace, um, uh, yeah, sure. I'll just go through it. Um, so the Chinese interest in cyberspace um, are uh, uh, you know, there's a whole range of interests that they have on the civ civilian side um, and on the military side as well. Um, so I think it's kind of um, not um, uh, particularly right to assume that China wants to be aggressive in cyberspace and it's going to do the kinds of things that it, 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 which, which can essentially um, imperil its own um, infrastructure because China also relies on a huge amount of uh, digital infrastructure. So it's not going to engage in uh, perilous behavior in cyberspace. They're going to be uh, restraint, they're going to do things that they're going to have red lines drawn for themselves in terms of how they kind of engage in cyberspace. Uh, they're not going to do things that are going to be harmful for their own interests, um, whether it's in the civilian side or on the, or on the uh, military side. So there are, they, they do have certain uh, norms that they're going to um, use within their own definition of how they're going to exercise this power. Um, in terms of the internet infrastructure, um, these are the different kinds of um, you know units within China that are engaged in um, different forms of um, um, you know behavior, the kinds of roles that they actually play. Um, 
on the military and civilian side and uh, you know essentially these are the kinds of um, and the kinds of roles that they play are very distinct uh, um, the organization that has i think got a lot of attention is the chinese uh, the china space cyberspace administration which organizes the china internet forum the world china internet forum every year um, and it's kind of becoming more and more uh, uh, the kind of the public face if you will of china's uh, internet policies um, in terms of technology strategy um, one of the most important things that I would like to focus on here is the fact that um, the the, the long-term programs, uh, the science, the science and technology programs, which actually run out run for at least ten years, um, and cyber is very much a part of it. Um, and uh, you know, cyber and space, I would say, are probably the two main things where China is increasingly showing a lot of interest in investing. And the reason why cyber is so critical is because of the notion of what they call as informatization, a term that you see very often used extensively in Chinese literature and uh, in all of their, uh, you know, um, and that encompasses both the both both society as well as the military. In other words, the state, society, and military are all part of it. Um, so the, the the idea that they need to have a um, an informatized society, um, a society that's completely empowered with information, uh, and as well as use the same. Um, to defend themselves against uh, what what China looks at as um, you know threats from uh, cyberspace. Um, the informatization uh, process um, essentially started uh, in the 90s, and it has steadily kind of progressed over the last 25 years. Um, and uh, and the Chinese have expressed an ambition to um, you know to at least kind of. Um, get to a point in, 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 in terms of information technology to a point where they can um, you know, start matching US capabilities in the next 15-20 uh, years. Um, and that um, is fueling a lot of their uh, you know, cyber technology strategy. So I, um, the PLA um, is, a, is a critical part of it. You know, um, a lot of it is expressed in the new Chinese military strategy document that came out last year, um, which gets into this uh, concept of preparation of a military struggle. Uh, the concept of active defense, all of these things are uh, very much part of the, uh, the cyber uh, doctrine that China is, uh, is now actively pursuing. The fact that they have a cyber command right now, um, with, which is operational, uh, we don't know how many, um, you know, uh, how, how, how it's structured and what are the different forces are yet, but I think we'll probably get more information because there's a lot more information that's forthcoming on, on these issues. So the, the, um, the, Idea of, uh, from a military perspective at least, um, I think the cyber active defense and the adventurism needs to be seen in the context of what is going on in the strategic environment that China operates in today. And that comes brings us to the, the disputes in the South China Sea and the kinds of uh, conflicts that can potentially break out and the kind of role that cyber technology is going to play in such a conflict. Um, uh, the in, uh, Cyber is going to play a very critical role uh, in any kind of a uh, potential conflict because they see that as a as a, a particularly important aspect of their overall military strategy, and uh, the PLA's uh, Strategic Support Force, which is a new uh, um, organization that was announced as part of the recent modernization uh, plans, uh, includes cyber and space, uh, which is a completely new uh, area which they have brought all the cyber and space and the and what they call as the Strategic Support Force um, as well. So um, I'm just going to quickly kind of uh, get into the India uh, India's interest in cyberspace uh, as a comparative uh, study and um, and from um, the literature that I have seen and the interactions that I've had and uh, things so it's it's my own thesis on on this it's, there's no um, you know um, research paper or anything yet uh, but I'm just putting together some initial thoughts and ideas on, on how India looks at cyber uh, primarily. Um, it's a very um, a diffuse scenario in India because there's no one national IT strategy that um, you know that somebody defines and the rest of the organizations you know essentially take over and execute. Uh, there's the Department of Electronics <coughs> that is a civilian uh, organization that looks at cyber essentially as a development tool. That's it. I mean, they 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 are not concerned about what what goes on on the military side. You know, it's, it's a purely civilian organization. And then you have um, the um, the NTRO and a few other organizations uh, within the Prime Minister's office that is looking at it primarily from the perspective of uh, you know military, uh, you know, in, uh, defend def defending um, you know critical infrastructure protection and, and all those kinds of areas. Um, and so, 
um, and, the, and the military is, is looking at cyber as well. You know, the army, the navy, and the air force. Uh, they are looking at cyber in their own ways in terms of how they want to address um, you know issues. And they are looking at it primarily from a defensive perspective at this point, from at least what I've gathered. Um, so they are fortifying their defenses and they are investing a lot in cyber technology to make sure that they that they can defend themselves in the in, in, in the phase one attack. Um, so this is like the you know the the architecture essentially the military and the civilian side the different uh, you know agencies that are involved. Um, so in terms of India's technology strategy, um, what happened was I think in '83 um, you know I, um, as part of my research over the last year or so of, of, of some of the work that I was doing on um, you know computer chips, um, what I um, and, and and getting into some in depth discussions that I had with people at Deity and some information that I, I was able to gather some. Resources, uh, research resources. Um, the primary shift in terms of the state determining technology policy for IT changed in '83. Uh, until '83, India was very much the state-guided, uh, you know, IT strategy. Uh, was pursuing a state-guided IT strategy. In other words, the state and state-owned enterprises um, were given the kind of the uh, prime importance in IT strategy making, and the state was putting resources into these enterprises, um, like companies like uh, Electronics Corporation. Um, you know, several companies, whether CMC, Computer Maintenance Corporation, I mean, a whole bunch of companies out there. But in '83, there was a big policy shift that happened um, under a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Seshagiri, um, who was then the Secretary of Electronics, and he was the last uh, um, scientific bureaucrat to be a, a head of the Electronics Department of Electronics. And he came up with a set of policies which essentially fundamentally changed the nature of electronics policy making in India in '83. And um, essentially, India that decided at that point in time that hardware was not a focus anymore, uh, and software was where the country was headed. And the last 30 years, of what we are seeing essentially is, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, the evidence of that policy essentially playing out in the public realm. Um, so, why is strategic restraint uh, something that? Um, that India pursues in terms of uh, cyber. I think, um, um, I argue that it's because it's a co-principle in India's national security doctrine. And um, the, 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 the threshold for the use of force is much higher um, in, the, in, the, in, that, in, in that doctrine. So, so you, when you have set a national security doctrine that's based on strategic restraint, it kind of flows into other areas as well. And cyber is one of those areas which is increasingly um, you know, it's, it's a new thing that, that policymakers are dealing with. So they kind of tend to kind of use similar kind of conceptual ideas in looking at cyber as well. Um, and it's become a default option because of the kinds of, um, you know, externalities and the internal drivers that are, um, you know, driving, uh, uh, you know, cyber uh, policies. And, um, and, I, and, and I basically, I argue that, um, you know, because India is an emerging information power and the kinds of, um, Issues that are there in terms of the inadequacies with, on the hardware side, as well as on the software, uh, you know, uh, cybersecurity product side, there is a lot of uh, you know push towards uh, uh, you know uh, limiting that and making sure that strategic restraint is followed. And uh, other countries are doing the same thing: Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Canada. All of these countries have exceptional amount of strategic restraint in cyberspace. In other words, they are uh, they are essentially uh, building defenses uh, to defend themselves. And uh, they are not engaged in any kind of, uh, you know, espionage or any large-scale, um, you know, um, activities. Um, so India, essentially, I think, is in the company of these companies um, in terms of how it looks at, uh, you know, cyberspace overall. Um, so um, basically, um, uh, I want to conclude by saying that, um, you know, I think um, the uh, the Chinese um, uh, behavior in cyberspace is um, is is probably going to um, um, get more and more, uh, you know, adventurous. Um, you're going to see as their capabilities keep growing and as they kind of build new capabilities um, in hardware as well as in other areas, and they gain more confidence in um, understanding, you know, what's going on in the in the global internet. And um, and because of the amount of espionage that they are doing, they have enormous amount of cyber intelligence, and they are they 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 are able to figure out, they are able to map out the global internet in much more. Uh, intrusive ways than they were able to do, say, maybe 10 years ago. So which means that they have this large-scale idea of view of what's going on in cyberspace in real time. You know, in, so that gives them enormous confidence in trying to kind of um, engage in the kinds of activities. And uh, 
um, the most of what you're seeing, at least in the in the public sphere, is the rivalry between the U.S. and China being played out. You know, there's a lot of uh, you know uh, discussions at the very high levels going on between the two countries on cyber. Uh, but we have not seen much progress being made in terms of um, either um, some kind of a some cyber norms or behavior being. Um, you know, there are some discussions going on in the U.N. and other places, but. Um, Unless the U.S. and China can come to some kind of an agreement on cyber norms or behavior in cyberspace, it's going to be um, a lot more difficult for other states to, to follow suit. And uh, there is talk of a cyber treaty at some point in time uh, where states can essentially then agree on certain norms of behavior that can then dictate how they kind of behave in cyberspace. Um, so um, I want to conclude by saying that you know these two aspects, the fact that India's strategic restraint in cyberspace and China's uh, what I call a strategic adventurism in cyberspace, um, are going to be key features of the security architecture in, in, in Asia um, in terms of how the um, um, whole cyber architecture is going to evolve in, 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 in Asia Pacific. Uh, today, you know, most of the discussions on cyber is between what's going on between the US and China. There's hardly any discussions on a regional context or what's happening within Asia um, in the context of Japan, China, India, um, and other states in Asia as well, in terms of how these states can come together to evolve a kind of an architecture. So I, I think we need to see this in perspective in terms of um, you know, a regional um, emphasis. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, I think you'll agree that that was quite a wide spectrum of issues that Ramesh covered. And, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, the set of questions can also be from a whole spectrum. Uh, and I think Ramesh is quite capable of answering it. Um, he's also covered the South China Sea, which I, quite frankly, did not expect to come up in this. Uh, you know, I'm, let me, you know, set the ball rolling by asking a question related to one of your conclusions, which is this last thing that you mentioned about regional arrangements. You know, when you say that the, the 11 root servers are based in the U.S. when everything is controlled out of the U.S. Uh, by the U.S. government, what exactly would a regional architecture on cyber issues look like? What would it comprise when you actually have the levers somewhere else, right? I think that's that's a, that's the first question. The second question relates to the what you opened with your you know the nuclear analogy. Um, now, in the context of India and China, it would seem to me uh, a better analogy would come from the space domain, where again the space program is civilian in nature. Uh, in India, but has a fair amount of government, uh, you know, supervision, government, uh, what, is, what is this thing, uh, handmade approach. Whereas in, in, in China, the space program is military. The civilian applications come secondary, or the civilian uh, aspect of it. Uh, so I thought that, you know, to compare the space program or uh, just use the space analogy in the, in the context of India-China where cyber issues are concerned would probably be a little more useful. Um, finally, uh, since you're talking about cyber governance, the MEA has now a cyber governance initiative as part of it, a specialized division within the MEA. What is your assessment of this particular division it's worked so far. It's been over two or three years since it's been in Thank you. And you could answer that and then we'll Sure. Um, yeah, in terms of a regional architecture, um, I think one of the things that needs to happen is there's got to be more dialogue between the uh, states in Asia. That hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, from, from what I understand that China has not been particularly forthcoming in having any dialogue on cyber. Um, but I think India has tried doing that and um, you know, from what I understand, from what I can understand, they have not been, uh, you know, they've been dismissive of, of it. And basically, they have not uh, been, been forthcoming, even a track to dialogue or, on, on, on something like cyber, which is very important to have. Uh, and even if China is not, I think India needs to take some steps towards trying to initiate a, um, 
uh, at least start off with South Asia, a dialogue within South Asia on cyber um, in a much more uh, you know, open fashion with countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, which are also countries that have infrastructure, a lot of IT infrastructure, and they have similar kind of interests uh, in cyberspace as well, uh, to see if they could uh, come to an agreement on how they can exp uh, you know, uh, have some kind of restraint in not um, you know, attacking each other's uh, cyber infrastructure. Um, that is, you know, what we see a lot of, there's a lot of attacks going on in South Asia, mostly kind of uh, defacing attacks, like, you know, we just deface a website or something like that, take, out, take down the website for a few hours. Those kinds of things are happening, you know, all the time between, I think, uh, hackers and so on and so forth. But um, states can, um, that I'm not sure if states can prevent completely, because, you know, cyber is an open space, anybody can do, you know, whatever they want sitting in their uh, basement. So, but state action in terms of, you know, state actors can, take some steps to kind of do that. And then India can then broaden that discussion to bring in other states as well in Asia. Not just China, but Vietnam, um, you know, other Southeast Asian states, and maybe also engage with uh, 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 Korea and Japan on, 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 on this area, uh, on this issue. And see if there's some kind of a um, coalition that can be built um, where you could then persuade China to kind of, you know, uh, put some restraints in terms of what they're doing. Uh, because what, what I understand is that the Chinese have also been um, doing a lot of espionage on Indian IT firms, uh, trying to you know, get uh, into into their uh, infrastructure to get uh, intellectual property and so on and so forth. Um, I have no evidence to suggest it, but this is something that I've heard and it's been mentioned in the newspapers, uh, reports have, have come out. Uh, but there's no uh, you know attribution, uh, positive attribution that I can uh, cite at this point. Um, so that is one area I think where um, there's a real need for some kind of a you know architecture that needs to be built um, within Asia where there's at least discussions that can happen uh, start happening because today the cyber discussion that everybody looks up to is India, the U.S. and China that's it pretty much you know because they are they have a particular adversarial relationship so um, and I'm not sure if that kind of a model needs to be applied in in, in other uh, theaters particularly in, a, in, a, in Asia, where I think there are a lot more countries which are dependent on information technology and information, uh, you know, and also using this as a socio-economic development tool as well. Uh, because the internet is, 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 as I said, it's a contested space, but it's also a <clears throat> huge, uh, um, you know, place for, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, social economic, uh, you know, um, the, for people in general, for, 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 the, for the vast majority of people who don't have access to internet services. Um, the space program thing, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, the nuclear analogy, I, I didn't suggest that in the context of India-China, but I was just giving it as a as how it differs from from cyber. Um, you know, in terms of how the how states really look at nuclear and how they look at cyber. Um, um, I think the space program, I think, is uh, is a very good example where India's space space program came out of the civilian uh, you know initiatives and. Uh, but now, of course, space security is becoming a big, big issue as well. Trying to defend space assets, so India is also beginning to look at, um, um, you know, you know, India wants to stay away from militarization of space. I think they have been forced to look at space also from a from a security perspective. Um, in terms of cyber governance and what the MEA is doing, uh, I think um, the the issue essentially is that um, you know. The MEA looks at cyber um, from the perspective of um, um, you know global governance uh, at global forums um, at the UN and uh, you know other areas, other other centers. Um, but cyber governance happens outside of the UN quite a bit. The way it's structured right now, most of the cyber governance happens within what's called ICANN, which is the company the corporation that manages these assets, uh, which is a private US corporation and. Uh, uh, and uh, so, um, come governments don't get a privileged position um, in discussions at forums like ICAP, uh, you know. And the MEA, uh, and, you know, bureaucracies are not used to being given a kind of a, a lower uh, ranking in terms of how they kind of or or being treated on par with other uh, non uh, you know non uh, non state actors or um, you know uh, NGOs and so on and so forth. Uh, so they, they they want to make sure that you know they represent the state, so they want a, a particular position. Um, and the UN, of course, is the way it's structured is that that's the way it works. So, you know, the, the, the state goes out um, and it's its sole representative at, as far as the UN is concerned. Whereas in ICANN, there are multiple, it's, it's, it's a kind of a multi-stakeholder model. So there are multiple stakeholders in ICANN and you have 
the state is just, the governments are just one bodies that, that kind of sit on it. So I think that, that's not something that makes them very comfortable. Um, and I think um, that's one of the reasons. And I think the other reason is also the issue of that India wants um, strategic autonomy in cyberspace. In other words, it is not interested in um, you know, aligning itself with any state, even if it's a powerful state like the U.S. Uh, and that is, of course, goes back to our foreign policy and, and the roots of our foreign policy. So, so the MEA approaches it from that perspective, very much, um, you know, strategic autonomy, um, you know, for norms in cyberspace, rules of uh, behavior, and, and uh, you know, how do you kind of, uh, you know, make sure that, you know, you can come to some kind of an agreement and, and on, on this. Whereas the way the governance structure is established right now, I mean, there's a lot of um, work going on in the UN on that front as well. You know, you can't say that there's no cyber governance going on in the UN. There's a lot of bodies is going on, but it is not so consequential uh, at this point uh, because the the power rests elsewhere than ICANN and the and, and the US controlled bodies. And the other thing is that India also has recently endorsed the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, you know. Um, uh, our uh, IT Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad was at the ICANN meeting in March um, of this year, where uh, uh, and um, at another uh, meeting that was held in Brazil last year, um, he actually gave a speech through a video. I'm not sure it's it's available on YouTube, where he talked about India's IT policy and what or that India is really willing to work with ICANN on on a multi-stakeholder model. Um, so it looks like India is pursuing two parallel tracks. There's one track that's pursuing, which is the multilateral approach, which is the traditional UN approach to internet governance. And then the other track is the multi-stakeholder model, where they are trying to see if they can win some gains out of the United States in, through a multi-stakeholder process, where they can kind of get some leverage in the current governance model the way it exists. So it looks like currently, I think they are pursuing these two tracks. And my sense is that the DT is more interested in the multi-stakeholder track, uh, whereas MEA is still very much focused on the multilateral track. So there are there are multiple um, you know um, approaches currently that are that that's moving in parallel, and there are two trains <laughs> that are that are that are going in different tracks right now. Uh, now, um, and I think it's it's perfectly uh, uh, possible that I think uh, because of the fact that, and I and I think this also has to do a lot with the kind of um, uh, momentum or uh, the kinds of things that you're seeing on the US-India uh, strategic relationship. Um, cyber is a very critical aspect of it. In fact, one of the, um, the foundation agreements um, that the US wants India to sign has a lot of cyber components attached to it. Um, I can, I'm not sure which one is it. Um, it either it's the BECA or the SISMO or one of those. Uh, I think it's the SISMO one, which, uh, which clearly has that India will be much more aligned with the U.S. Um, in terms of um, you know cyber and in terms of opening up Indian networks for uh, U.S. access and so on. So, so there it's it's a very complicated situation. Uh, and if if um, my sense is that um, I'm Deity is looking at it more from the perspective of trying to um, increase leverage within ICANN. Um, and um, if you see all of the, uh, and that's why I think uh, because uh, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad is from Deity, so you know he, he heads the, um, the the department. So, so you could see that they are. Uh, uh, but I'm not entirely clear if if any has bought into that multi-stakeholder approach completely, uh, hundred percent. You know they are going along because the government formally has taken a position. While they are while at the UN, they are still taking the multilateral approach. Well, differences in approach within the government of India. It's nothing new. Questions from the audience? Can you explain the difference between the multi, uh, uh, multi lateral and the multi stakeholder? Yes. I don't fully understand the difference. Yeah. The multi stakeholder model of internet governance essentially uh, says that um, there are several stakeholders in governing the internet, and that includes um, uh, you know, non state uh, actors, uh, NGOs, um, academics, um, companies large internet companies, uh, the companies that uh, manage the websites, um, the domain names, all of them. So everybody has an equal stakeholder and the mm -hmm. government is just another stakeholder in that process. In other words, the government is just another stakeholder in governing the internet. It's not the sole stakeholder. Whereas the multilateral approach is the traditional approach where the government is a sole stakeholder. It goes to the UN and it takes the country's position and it argues and puts its position in front of the UN. So it's a um, it's a very much a kind of a, a state, um, you know, sponsor, state-dominated kind of a governance model. 
and these two model and the internet has always been a multi-stakeholder. Uh, you know, the way the US wanted it that way um, in the 90s because it's a model that is much more easier for them to uh, manage and to kind of push their own agenda rather than, uh, you know, have a, how the telephone network, for example, is managed by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and that's completely under the UN. So the, all our tele, tele, telecommunications networks are all managed in a multilateral model. Whereas the internet is uh, the way, because of the way it evolved, um, it's always remained within the multi-stakeholder. And the ICANN meeting in March adopted the multi-stakeholder approach or? No, the, there was a change. There was the a change. change. The change uh -huh. in the March meeting was uh -huh. that the US government is now saying that they will have a, a restructuring of the way they are governing this uh, thing. And ICANN will now no, no longer be completely tied to the US government. Uh -huh. um, but how they are actually going to implement this and how it's going to actually, um, you know, happen in reality, we don't know because um, they have signed a contract with ICANN until 2019. So until 2019, um, they don't have to make any changes. You know, they can go through this process. Um, but my sense is that it's just they are just rejigging the you know the deck a little bit. They are trying to bring some more new companies that will then be controlled by ICANN in, between ICANN and others and the and the, the multi-stakeholder community. Um, but there's nothing being spoken about Verisign. For example, mm -hmm. Verisign is still very much the, uh, yes. the, the the company that's going to manage it. So how are they going to do that? You know, um, if if uh, global governance needs to completely get democratized, where uh, you know they need the U.S. accedes uh, to a multilateral approach, they would transfer um, all the functions to the UN, mm -hmm. the current functions to the UN, um, and it will completely be uh, controlled by gov uh, you know governments. Mm -hmm. And uh, governments will then have a say in how uh, you know the internet evolves in future. All governments have, will have an equal say in how it moves forward in future, which I, I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime in the near future. Let me ask you now some uh, uh, those are clarifications which I want to do now. Uh, in first of all, if you look at the security dimension of the cyber structures or the cyberspace that we have at the moment in the world. Uh, it looks very diffused simply because there are far too many players and there are far too many players outside the state control. So it's not just one entity or the other who has the button, in, in, uh, who, has, who has his finger on the button where he can press and wreak havoc in case they choose to. A single person from the basement, as you said, can do so. Uh, I could sound confused, but basically, because the whole thing is very confusing, mm -hmm. it's very, very. Uh, 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 therefore, given the current state of play, uh, the questions which come to my mind is: Is it possible to really think of a secure cyber security structure, regional or global or anything? We can talk bilaterally, we can talk in terms of the cyber space, uh, cyber crime, etc., etc. But is it possible to have a global cyber security structure at all? That is one point. Number two, uh, you know, when we talk about the security aspects of it, uh, when we talk about the nuclear weapons, when we talk about the, uh, the biological weapons, chemical weapons, they are specific physical entities, where they are located, they are controlled by a particular person. In the cyberspace, the very idea of a weapon is not physical. It is not located in a particular domain. So given that kind of a thing, how do we even think of a cyber warfare, to, so to say? We can think of cyber hacking. But those are basically, you know, yeah. playing with the other countries' systems. Mm -hmm. You can you can steal the credit data. You can bring the aircraft uh, security systems down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how do you think of a cyber warfare per se, mm -hmm. given that there is no physical location, there is no physical entity as such? Uh, I think those are the questions which uh, sound very confused in my own mind. Really, I don't know. Would that make any sense to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, things that 
things that you're saying. Uh, so let me just respond to the first one, the cybersecurity structure that you are mentioning, and then I'll go to the cyber mm -hmm. weapons aspect. Um, I don't know if there's a possibility of a cybersecurity structure globally, but what you could have is a cyber treaty, like the NPT. You could have a cyber treaty. Um, I'm not saying that you know, along those lines where, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, but there is a possible, there, there is a, if, if, if countries can come together, um, the countries for which um, information technology is so critical to running their, you know, because digital infrastructure is becoming so critical for nations, you know, um, just for running the country on a day-to-day -day basis, because everybody is dependent on it. Um, there is a possibility of having some kind of a cyber treaty, but it has to come within the UN framework. And uh, there is some discussions going on, there's a manual that was put out called the Talon Manual, uh, you know, on cyber warfare and, you know, and uh, norms of behavior in cyberspace. Uh, how international laws can actually work within the cyber context. The current international laws as they exist of uh, warfare, um, the, you know, the, uh, the law of armed con conflict and so on. So there's some discussions going on, but the US essentially is still trying to kind of uh, influence those discussions. Even the talent manual was put together by a Harvard uh, professor. He actually essentially wrote it. Um, so um, currently I think the US is not too happy, you know, um, interested in it because you know mm -hmm. they, they want to dominate the space and they are in a very dominant position. So the question is why do we have to engage in a, in a cyber treaty right away? Um, but once, if you see, if, if they see China is building capabilities very quickly and it is uh, steadily rising in terms of uh, you know the kinds of capabilities they have, you could see a kind of a cyber treaty. But the problem is that uh, countries like India have to be really careful about what this treaty is going to be. Because you don't want to be in the same position that you got into with the NPT, you know, where you're kept out of, the, of this treaty and two countries come together and, and, and approach it that way. So I think that's the only possibility that exists. I don't think there's a possibility of any global security structure that mm -hmm. countries can come together at a global level. You know, the most that they can possibly do um, together is a kind of a cyber treaty um, at, the, at the global level. But I think we are far, far, far away from uh, getting into this, an element of that as, at this point in time. I'm certain, uh, but a treaty, even treaty, would require basically somebody to guarantee implementation of its provisions, yes. which can be done only by the states. By states, and yes, exactly. It has to be with no control yeah. over who does what. Therefore, I think even treaty looks very far away. Right. Yeah. That comes definitely to remind everybody that Ambassador Goel is from the MEA. Yeah. So I guess. Mm, no, but at the moment I'm not talking to the MEA. Rather, I'm talking to somebody. The MEA. But so I'm talking to somebody who knows a little bit about the cyberspace. Okay. That's all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So the the cyber weapons part of it plays into that. Um, you know, I think what you're talking about is verification and those kinds of things. Like you know, mm -hmm. nuclear, for example. You know, you could actually get into verification with satellite based mm -hmm. verification. A whole bunch of things that you could do to make sure that if somebody says that we're getting rid of uh, you know chemical weapons, can you do verification to do that? In cybers, it's a lot more difficult. Why? Because of the nature. It's just code. It's sitting mm -hmm. somewhere in somebody's server. You know, how do you verify whether a state has what cyber weapons they have? Um, there's still no universal definition of what a cyber weapon is at this point in time. You know, because this field is so rapidly changing and evolving, but nobody can come to an agreement on what a definition of a cyber weapon is. Which I think the people in the talent manual and others are trying to now understand and figure out. But states have to um, come, come to that conclusion. Because I think we are essentially in cyberspace at a point in time like where nuclear was, say, in the 1950s. You know. So that's the level of development in cyber right now, uh, of, in terms of international norms and international treaties and so on. So we have like a long time ahead of us before we could actually come to these kinds of uh, discussions where people can agree on these things and have some uh, kind of a agreement on you know, what cyber weapon actually is and how do you verify it and so on. So it could be a virus. I mean, you want to control the system, you, you can launch a virus. That's right. So it could be a very initial form of virus if you're talking about inside cyber weapon. Yeah, and it can be non-state actors who can do it too. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing is that uh, there could be non-state actors who are working for states. Um, and uh, the again, the other problem is attribution. You know, attribution in cyberspace is still a very, very uh, um, nebulous area. Uh, nobody has a very good idea of if that, whether the attack was launched by so and so person from this uh, particular, uh, you know, machine, and whether the state was involved in it or not. Uh, because China, for example, they are extensively using non-state actors right now. Uh, but it's very difficult to 
to say if uh, you know all the attacks are coming only from them or is it coming directly from the Chinese state as well? Uh, you know, because there was a company called Mandian which did an extensive reporting about some time back where they. But of course, it's a U.S. Uh, version of what they are putting out. So we have to be really skeptical about these things because how do you, you know, how, how do you kind of uh, verify if there's truth to these reports? And, and so, these, uh, PLS, uh, so the PLS, so the US you mentioned PLS six one three nine. Yeah. So I think China has officially confirmed that it is under the People's Liberation Army and it is going specifically after the American companies. So I mean there is state involvement, but it's yeah, but I think there's there's also uh, you know increasingly uh, evidence that is being presented saying that the Chinese military is not particularly interested in commercial IP theft. Um, they are only interested in military technologies. So they are going after companies like Lockheed Martin and others in the U.S. But they are not interested in um, you know because uh, you know even if they get all this IP, what are they going to do with it? How are they who are they going to give it to? Um, and how does it benefit? So. We are still not. We have not still seen evidence to suggest that commercial IP theft has somehow benefited China in a big way. Uh, you know, whereas we know for sure that military military technologies have benefited because we are seeing some of the military systems and hardware that they are putting out that you could see that they have advanced very quickly in a very short time. So um, that seems to suggest that the PLA primarily is interested primarily in military stuff, but they are not. But there's a lot of dual use there too. So they could they could uh, use some of that for uh, in, in, you know they pass they could pass it off some of those. If there's some new communications technology that comes along, they see they might pass it on to Huawei. Who knows? We don't know. So there's uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, transfer sharing that's going on too. Uh, even in chip technology and everything that's going on. So there's there's this widespread sharing that happens, um, and it happens in the U.S. as well. You know. Technology diffusion, that's how it happens, you know. Either it happens through uh, a, a proper channel to diffuse technology or it happens kind of on its own. Uh, you know, GPS is a classic case. You know, it started off as a military technology, but today it's on everybody's mobile phone. So, um, you know, so, so it's very difficult to say who's engaging in what and what exactly is, it, is, is going on on a, on, a, on a kind of a regular basis. Um, but, you know, the fact is that the U.S. has identified five Chinese military officers and sanction them. So it's, it yes. can be done. And I think uh, you are right in that governments are, or the US probably is not so much concerned about cyber theft by military or for military purposes. That goes on at all times. The primary concern is whether there is diffusion between the Chinese military from the Chinese Chinese military no. to the Chinese civilian sector. Yes. And the case you mentioned, Huawei, yeah. is essentially started by military officer has military interest and I think that's where the core concern is. And this pressure not not only comes from a security point of view, but it also comes from commercial entities, commercial interests in the US to sanction or to stop such diffusion. Yes. Uh, it's, from the, uh, it's not the just US. the US but all Western governments. All Western governments. Yeah. Uh, including Australia, um, New Zealand, Canada, all these countries are increasingly concerned because their uh, companies are also being under subject to enormous cyber uh, espionage right now. Um, and there the Chinese are clearly either using non-state actors or companies, Chinese companies are using non-state actors on their own at the behest of the government to uh, engage in, you know, widespread, uh, um, you know, uh, IP theft. So that is a cause for concern. They are not concerned so much on the military side. These countries like Canada and Australia, you know, they are not concerned so much about what China is doing on the military side. They are more concerned about their own economic, that their, their economic commercial, uh, you know, competitiveness of uh, of research and development and all the money that they are spending on these things are being kind of, you know, taken away. So that, that that's I think the concern for some of these companies. Can I make a Sorry, someone. Mm -hmm. uh, two uh, quick uh, questions. Um, one is you know, you uh, talked about um, Sino-American rivalry, or what is uh, called Thucydides, uh, Thucydides' trap, where a rising power and established power is a contestation. So, uh, I would like to bring the cyber uh, domain uh, in the context of this uh, Thucydides' uh, trap. Who do you think will be uh, uh, the gainer, uh, whether China, with its dogged pursuit to be number one, or U.S., which is a, has a alliance favoring uh, to it in the medium to long term. Maybe uh, in short, in the short range, uh, short domain, China is doing uh, well. But in medium to uh, long term, do you think uh, U.S. will have the edge in cyber uh, space? And uh, and at last point, uh, you mentioned uh, 
India's strategic restraint. But you know, uh, Modi uh, last year he gave a statement of that India should be a leading power, a leading power, uh, which Ashley Tellis described as India should be or interpreted that India should be a great power. So, do you think in that context that uh, this strategic restraint might, uh, you know, be flexible? <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. See, currently, if you look at the um, the uh, level of uh, technology and the, the the quantity of intellectual property that the U.S. companies hold in the internet space, it is uh, an order of magnitude bigger than what China has. Um, uh, even in networking technology, where China has made a lot of advancements, Huawei and other companies, ZTE and so on. Um, but um, the thing is that with the networking technology, one of the most important things that drives this industry is innovation. Mm -hmm. The fact that you know you can get IP from you know elsewhere, but what you do with it and how do you actually build a product with it? Um, there's a huge gap, you know, getting IP is one thing, but actually deploying it and actually building a product and then being able to convince customers to go buy it and being able to innovate rapidly and come up with new systems um, is something that uh, the innovation system still in, the, in China is very weak. And that goes back to, you know, intellectual property laws and how they, um, you know, um, give uh, credence to those kinds of things. Um, in the US, it's a, it's a well-established ecosystem. You know, the innovation ecosystem is a well-oiled machine. It, like, it functions and it's been established over several decades. So my sense is that um, it's difficult. I mean, yes, China is making uh, advances, but are they, are they able to kind of match and are they, can they surpass? That's a big question, but I'm not, I don't think, even, the, even, even I think there's some rhetoric uh, that um, that gets associated in a lot of the media reports about where China is and how, how advanced it is. Because innovation is still an area where there's a lot of weaknesses and they are still trying to address that. Partly because of the way the state functions, also because of uh, you know um, the fact that they still don't have a, a venture capital ecosystem that's as strong as what the US has. Um, so you're going to see, it's going to take several decades for China to come to the point position where they can say, well, you know, we are on par with uh, you know, where, the, where the U.S. is. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in the in the immediate, or short to medium term. I can't see that because if you look at all the innovation that's still happening, the U.S. is still uh, innovating, it's still uh, doing my things much faster. Um, so the question of leading power, I think that's a very good question um, and how it relates to cyber. Um, you're right, I think Ashley Tellis did connect that aspect of leading power to great power. Because um, I think it was uh, uh, the foreign secretary who used that term in uh, the first yes, speech yes. in Singapore, I think, that he gave at the Fullerton lecture last year. And then he made uh, used the same uh, terminology recently at the uh, uh, Carnegie uh, India, in, you know, India inauguration. Like. Yes. Um, so um, now. You know, the, it's still a very evolving thing. It's a, I think the, the you know the, the great power uh, aspirations is, is very much there. The question is, um, and cyber space, these are all areas which are integral to that. Uh, you know, to the to, to kind of um, increasing military power. Um, but um, I'm not sure if you know um, that that India is still kind of uh, going, you know, make, taking the kind of steps to kind of get to that point. You know, we are still in the early stages of doing it. I, I, I do believe that I think most policymakers, at least this is my own personal view, is that policymakers are at least the people who are in uh, really uh, important positions within government. Um, I think are still not convinced that India has the all the capable the, the elements of power uh, to be able to exercise to to kind of advance to that uh, position uh, you know at least at, as things stand today now that does not mean that uh, you know the aggrandizement of power will not happen it will happen over a period of time but uh, i'm not sure if um, if there is a you know the uh, there's a timeline to it saying that okay by 25 2030 we are going to be a, a great power or something i don't think there's anything that is uh, particularly assigned to it. So, which means that things will kind of take its own uh, uh, time to, to get to that point, you know. Um, and which is one of the points that uh, Mr. Bharat Karnad has made in his book as well. So, uh, you know, the fact that... Uh, yes, not a good uh, power yet. Yes, exactly. Um, 
So you know, of course, he's talking about a much more uh, you know aggressive approach to um, getting to a great power status, um, which I'm I'm, saying I'm not sure if uh, you know uh, there's widespread agreement within the Indian um, you know foreign policy community on that as on that part of it in terms of the kinds of measures that he's suggesting. Um, so, but my uh, question is that even if India becomes a great power, my uh, argument is that India will you still have strategic restraint in uh, uh, because it's very much tied to the national security doctrine, unless national security doctrine changes in fundamental ways, um, you're not going to see much um, aggressive moves on in, in cyberspace or in any other uh, field for that matter. Because um, you know, one of the things that uh, I was attending is that there was a space policy dialogue that was held about uh, two months ago where the space security aspects of it came into play. And you know, the question was, what is India doing about space security? You know, what, what is India's policy on space security? And the answer was essentially that, you know, same thing. Uh, strategic restraint. That was the overall uh, thing that came back. Um, so, my own view is that you know it's it's probably going to be a, a, a fundamental because it's it's, it's embedded in, um, in in strategic culture. It's embedded in uh, in, uh, in, in, in in doctrine. And so, unless those things change, you're not going to see much happen on, on that front. So you are. No, I was just going to make a brief suggestion, if I could, slightly aside from the presentation you have made. Because uh, given the nature of the cyberspace at present, really, I mean, and it's going to be very, very difficult to think of this space uh, leading to a warfare system or the warfare kind of a situation. I think what is happening in the cyberspace more, uh, at present is more related or more akin to terrorism, really, where the availability of the power to the state actors as well as the non-state actors diffuses the power so much that any single person can use it for its own objective, uh, their own objective. So it's, it's closer to exercise of terrorism or uh, uh, and if we come to that kind of a threat from the cyberspace, then I would say that it's not China per se which we should be concerned about because China still has very strong state controls over, the, over its industry. But I think uh, people who are engaged with like AQ or ISIN, Taliban, who have access to this technology and can use it. So and that brings in Pakistan, really speaking, which can get the technology from China and those are seven people. So I think one should look at really the terrorism aspect of the cyberspace and the possible misuse of it by those elements I mentioned. Yeah. I think now we'll start to, yeah, start pulling. So you no, want no, to let you take up others. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ramesh. Two just comments. I don't know whether there is any standard where we can call it as a global or global cyber governance because if you look at the US governments, US cyber governments, uh, I think I doubt it because if you look at the the recent of uh, recent case of San Bernardino, you know, the shooters, and they asked for ask Apple to actually keep break the code and Apple said we they cannot do it. But they later agreed and they took a different code language and they could break the phone actually. So there is a basic uh, problem in the you know the concept of cyber governance, I object to that first. Mm -hmm. And if there is a cyber governance, we assume that uh, whatever the US is saying is the governance of their, there is a democratic governance of cyber laws, I doubt that first. Second thing is, you mentioned, you know, like uh, in cyber capability, you mentioned that India has um, upper hand as well as cloud technology. Cloud technology. No, no. Something cloud? No, no, I basically said that uh, you know, so I said that there needs to India has a opportunity to build cloud okay, products. What, are, what is the trajectory of the cloud? The capability is to use cloud as a medium mm -hmm. security. Because you know, so there is there is a there is a complete life cycle actually. If you look at if you look at even the companies like Yahoo, they were the service providers. They went into the storage cloud. Uh, Hotmail, Amazon, they did the same thing. Symantec. They stop selling the antivirus, you know, really cheap down market products. They went to they went into build the storage storages. 
So do you think that life cycle is, you know, we, the Indians are building it actually? Or not? If it is not, there is no sense actually having any, you know, we don't have, I mean, my, my, my understanding is we don't have any preemptive, preemptive approach to build the suburb uh, security. And the last is about, uh, if, you recall, if you see that last year there was a report by India Today that a lot of ministries have this space, including the MOD, ME, they have the website and storages on uh, non Indian servers, US servers. And if you can just talk about this. Yeah. Thing. May See, I add my question to that? And then sure, yes, sure. It's related. <coughs> uh, I think that is now a uh, corporate anarchy. I'm deliberately using this term in uh, the emerging uh, parts process of cyberspace. Uh, corporates control and then uh, they uh, uh, they compete with each other and then in some of the some of the other countries like China uh, the government behaves like a corporate but a monopolistic uh, military sector and uh, they try to counter then there is a mutual hacking you know there are all kinds of things and then there are uh, constant efforts by uh, those who want to uh, build alternative power centers to use whatever is possible in the cyberspace to uh, interfere in that. Uh, I'm deliberately putting it this way because I think when you said there are two models, the UN uh, related global governance uh, possibility and then the multi-stakeholder. This is the new language of the last 20 years, 30 years, uh, to prevent multilateral global governance. Uh, because you see, the so-called multi-stakeholders, they also influence the government. I mean, when you have the COP21 uh, in Paris, it's a, it's a governmental thing, but also the whole world's all stakeholders are involved, are contributing to that process, uh, and um, therefore, the um, I think the goal should be uh, to have a uh, global governance order uh, where there are rules, there are technological uh, support for those rules, and now, for example, the. Uh, this is one area where you say innovation is so critical, and U.S. leads that. Now, um, there are two kinds of innovation. Innovation that uh, makes everything out of date uh, very soon. Another is innovation that maintains a long-term stability and adjusts. So there are many kinds of innovation. Uh, and that's the beauty of uh, the, the modern times. Uh, but um, uh, so, uh, the global governance, the UN uh, related global governance can look at these possibilities. Uh, I'm asking this with one central question uh, because you're fantastic. Uh, I really, you know, I'm uh, cyber illiterate. <laughs> I consider myself as. I'm interested in global trends, global transformation. That's why I want to use it for uh, my understanding of global history. Uh, I have a feeling that for the next 20, 30 years, this is going to uh, create more centralization of power globally in certain centers. Again, corporate, competitive corporate, uh, and today corporate and state, you know, they work together. Corporate, state, and military, they work together. And, uh, uh, but, the governance system will develop so much contradiction globally that then they will opt for uh, you know uh, ways of managing the system and then the prospects of democratizing prospects of rule based governance will increase but otherwise we we see now uh, a very difficult period of the next 20 years or so 
of cyber warfare, counter-terrorism and terrorism, hacking, and high degree of unpredictable centralization because of cyber power. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, centralization of uh, you know, cyber power, you, you know, is the, the infrastructure for uh, you know, controlling cyber power you know, resides primarily in the US. But the power is also diffused to the extent that uh, people have tools. The tools that are required to kind of operate in cyberspace is highly diffused. While the, the resources, what are called the critical internet resources, are highly uh, you know, centralized in areas. The tools that are people use to kind of launch cyber attacks, into, you know, those are highly diffused. And that is what makes this particular technology um, you know, so difficult to kind of get your hands on. In terms of um, you know, other technologies, the state has always had an um, overwhelming kind of control. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, even for example, drones. It's a technology in which the state still kind of controls the technology. You know, there are not, uh, you know, of course, now people are talking about uh, civilian drones and so on. But still, the basic technologies with regard to drones are all, and it cannot get, some, get into somebody's hands so easily that people can use it. So that's one of the main areas which I think is, uh, is, is uh, it goes back to my issue of cyber capabilities. You know, how these capabilities are have to be built. States can't build it on their own. It has to be the corporations that are ultimately going to build these capabilities. Whether it's a authoritarian state like China, or whether it's a country like India, you know, uh, which has a high, uh, kind of a market fundamentalism model, uh, where the state is not so much uh, guiding the development of the economy, or the, I mean, guiding the development of the industry, or the information industry. So it has to come from capabilities have to come from within the you know large corporations at the end of the day, and. When the capabilities all of multiple states kind of come to a point where there's some kind of parity, or at least near parity, then you will see more cooperation. Where states have mutual vulnerabilities, because both of them become mutually vulnerable to attacks. And that hasn't happened yet, um, you know, because the US still feels that it can, it has decisive advantage in cyberspace, that it is not, it can protect itself while attacking somebody. In other words, that's what they say, like, you know, you want this, essentially it's about dominance of the space and denial of space to somebody else. But small um, powers, and in, what about small powers? Well, uh, for small powers, no, it's the same. They don't have that capacity. Yeah, for, they don't like some kind of rule-based governance. Yes, they, the, that is essentially what the, the, why we, they are all pushing for a multilateral approach. You know, the, the, the African countries and the, 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 the G77, the, the old, uh, you know, the global south, those countries are all t t very much on, uh, you know, on the side of wanting to have some say. BRICS has dominance. not taken it up yet. No, there is a BRICS uh, separate uh, thing going on, but there is no, um, uh, you know, common approach within BRICS on cyber. Because these countries, you know, so Russia has its own thing, China has its own thing, so, you know, but China doesn't want... There was a recent want... statement by Rick, though. There was a recent statement by Rick on Yes, there, there was. Um, but I'm not sure, um, but India, you know, um, is a little bit uncomfortable. Um, it would, it, uh, in, in either siding with uh, Russia or China on this, on cyber. Um, because it's not something that uh, the values and the um, the, the interests and, and values there's a clash in those kinds of areas, um, and so it is at the same time it is not comfortable in completely siding with uh, the U.S. as well or with any of the other states. Because what's happening in, is you have um, you know the U.S. and all of the Western democracies on one side on, on as far as internet governance is, is concerned, and most of the Western democracies have some kind of. Uh, um, you know, they, they are okay with the way the internet is governed today. In the sense that, you know, France has had expressed a lot of uh, issues in the past about governance and so on, but largely you will see most of the countries are okay with the way things are going on, you know. Um, whereas uh, Russia, China are, are on one side, and then India is sitting somewhere in the middle, um, because it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not in a position to align itself with, uh, you know, any of these countries, um, because there's, there's, there's issues with both areas. And that's where the issue of strategic autonomy comes. And the question is, how do you then leverage um, in shaping norms, leverage your power to shape norms? And the only way to do that is to kind of build your own capabilities. And once you have more capabilities, then you'll have the ability to go out and you know shape some of these norms. Because then other countries also want to kind of make sure that you know you are brought on board as a as a player. Um, because you know the, in nuclear weapons, it's a lot easy. All that you need to do is like explode a nuclear weapon. You know and Countries at least are concerned about you, whether it's North Korea or uh, Iran, uh, which is close to getting a, you know, just close to getting a weapon. 
in cyber there's no such explosive moment that can happen where you say well we we do this and others are going to start paying attention to us it's not it's not a something that can happen one fine day you know it's something that takes years to build and these capable and it's not like uh, you can you know uh, there's no explosion of a cyber weapon in cyberspace or something that somebody's going to take notice of and so on so it's a, it's a very different kind of uh, the set the, the set of factors that you deal with are very different you know and there's no and that's one of the main reasons i think why people are struggling with with all of these issues right now is because it presents new challenges that states have not been used to in the past uh, it makes you think about these issues you got to fundamentally rethink the way you kind of uh, always imagine how these issues have to be you know um, conceptualized and understood uh, and that i think is the is a big uh, challenge today did you cover these questions absolutely no yeah so um, as far as this question is concerned i think the um, the nsa um, uh the uh the justice department i think the fbi is the one that went after apple uh recently uh, um you know the despite the fact that the us is a highly um um you know um what shall i say there's no there's not much of a it's not an industrial policy driven uh, economy you know there's no there's no centralized industrial policy making that happens uh, in government uh, in the us despite that and they want the private sector to take the lead they want the private sector to innovate the way they want to they, they there's no market guidance or any of those kinds of things that happens in you know in japan or korea or in china despite that i think there is a, a very um um you know high degree of uh, you know uh, emphasis of the state puts on um, dominance in terms of um, you know technologies um in other words they want the state to kind of own certain things that they don't want other people to have um and that goes back to the defense um you know establishment of the way the way the defense industrial complex has developed so and the same is applicable in in cyber as well and that's the reason why um when apple refused to um uh, turn over those uh, or turn over the codes for those two um uh, you know iPhones um the uh, the FBI went in and you know, i think they probably sought the help of the NSA the national security agency to actually break the code which means that they had some mathematician sitting inside the NSA that was able to do it and they were able to employ this this person or a group of people to be able to do it and the state still believes that they need to have those those kinds of tools where they they are sitting on top of the uh, the technology food chain if you will you know so um and i'm not sure if that's uh, going to change uh, you know substantially in 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 the future as far as cloud is concerned it's an area where there's a lot of opportunity because indian companies right now are using cloud technology uh, you know that others have built uh, but they themselves are not building cloud technology. so that's the area where there is a uh, opportunity for um, indian companies to actually start building uh, you know cloud technologies on their own um which means that uh, you know these are uh, cloud infrastructure then that these companies can sell to other other uh, companies as well uh, so the cloud cloud is one area that uh, as far as us servers where the you know information is concerned yeah that goes to the issue of the the whole data protection laws and the um issue of uh, you know data you know who owns the data and and so on and so forth um because um i think the, the we have seen these scenarios uh, play out quite a bit with blackberry um the kinds of issues that the government has had with blackberry as well and that's because um india relies on um uh, services provided by multinationals um so the multinationals are not going to you know put the service here they want to keep the service in the us or in other jurisdictions where they get uh, special benefits or whatever um and that's going to be a non going challenge until you build an internet economy with internet companies that are home grown um and i think uh, part of that came out in the recent facebook uh, internet.org uh, opposition that uh, the local domestic internet companies all rose up against uh, facebook uh, because they were concerned about facebook trying to dominate the internet space in india completely uh, and so that was a completely civil society organization civil society kind of a um uh, initiative that came out of the uh, you know the companies that 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 uh, occupy the space uh, it was not a government thing or anything like that so so things like that i think will will always be there to resist uh, those kinds of measures but uh, until um of course i don't think india can go down the chinese path as well you know given the the, the, the nature of how our society works and the political system and all of this you can't go down that path it's a slippery slope it can take you down things that which is which you may not be able to come back from so and i don't think the indian state is ever going to go into go down that path um but the question is how do you then maintain this balance of uh, 
of trying to have a good, uh, healthy internet economy of com made up of companies that are, that are based in India, while at the same time giving a fairly, um, you know, level playing field for the multinationals to come and operate here. So that's that's the that's the real challenge. And I think the, I don't think the government, um, the government I think is very much aware of these things. I mean, deity people are very much concerned about these things. But um, at the end of the day, there's, there's only so much you can do to. Uh, to force multinationals to to put a put up a server here to do things, so it's it's uh, and the, but, but you could get to a point where if the usage levels go up and, and then India is in a position to then tell them that you know we need to have these servers here, but if they refuse, what do you do? Because the jurisdictions, the legal jurisdictions are all in the U.S. You know you can't file a suit against Facebook here in India, so. Um, because the server is based, where, where is based is where the jurisdiction is. Um, so American companies do this uh, as part of a very well orchestrated strategy. I mean, it's uh, it's it's not something that happens in the thing. I mean, the U.S. government is very much part of it as well. They don't want the U.S. government does not want Facebook to put up servers all over the world as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a thing that um, goes hand in hand. Like I mean, they they see the same issue in the same way. So uh, that's one of the problems that I think. Uh, that uh, countries like India will probably have to deal with. Sorry. Just, uh, so in the classic Indian way, we start late and we finish late. And it remains for me to thank Ramesh for this presentation. And he ends with the dilemma that we are all faced with. Huh? India, the fix that India is in is that we lack the entrepreneurship, we lack the innovation, and uh, we lack the persuasive powers of the Chinese uh, in persuading Google or Facebook to either comply with national laws or stay up. Simple. Uh, we can't go down the Chinese path and yet we are somewhere in the middle, in limbo. Uh, and I'll leave you with that. We are in limbo. The, the, the only thing that I kind of uh, uh, would uh, kind of defer with is the fact that there's no entrepreneurship in this country. I don't think I, I could really agree with that. I think there's, there's a lot of entrepreneurship. I think what is lacking is um, a lot of this capital that can go into uh, investing in um, you know technologies that um, that are early stage or technologies that are going to take a lot more time to evolve and so on because you need a lot of money to chase some of these ideas. People have there are a lot of ideas and uh, there is an organization called iSpirit. If any of you are interested yeah. in it, you should probably take a look at the website. Um, I think it's a it's a great initiative that's just been launched. And uh, the government is uh, fully behind them uh, right now, and there's a um, there's a lot of uh, new rulemaking that's happening with regard to listing companies in India and so on. Some favorable terms being offered to Indian comp internet companies to list in India because many of them are threatening to go to Singapore or elsewhere. And now the government is responding, um, and the the government is now the, the government is responding in uh, big ways to to the to the to building these new product companies out of India, like not just the services, you know, we are used to seeing the services firms that have become very big, but the, the product companies I think are, are going to do well in going forward. Um, uh, the question is, uh, do they have enough money and is there enough capital available uh, out there? But there's a, I don't think there's a depth of entrepreneurs in this country. There's, there's an enormous amount of people who are willing to take risks and who want to go do things. Um, uh, but the question is, is there enough capital to fund those ideas? Um, and that, because most of the capital that you see like is, is mostly going after, uh, you know, internet commerce companies or uh, somebody who's selling, uh, you know, food startups and those kinds of things, you know, most people are kind of comfortable with them because, you know, there's a quick return and so on. But real risk capital that goes after these big ideas like cloud and all that, that uh, we're discussing, is requires a lot more uh, uh, money that can stay there for a longer period and there's a lot more risk involved in these ventures and somebody should be able to come up with those. Uh, and you think this capital should come? The seed capital should come from government, or no, no, no. It will come. It will in India. It's not going to come from government. Um, uh, the government has a, um, what's called an electronics development fund. Actually, uh, they had announced it in the 2012 uh, electronics policy that was put out by DT, where they announced two billion dollars. Actually, almost uh, you know for uh, an electronics development fund. Um, now they are trying to. Um, put that fund into some venture capital firms that are run by the, uh, some of the state-owned banks. Um, I think Canada Bank has a venture fund and I think SBI also has a few of those. Um, 
and uh, but that still is in discussion. I have not heard much from in terms of how that's going to be operationalized and how that money is actually going to get into the hands of entrepreneurs at some point. Uh -huh. It's going to take uh, some time, but I think the, the new government um, last year, I think they have revived this thing. It was launched by the previous government, but this government has not taken it up and they are now uh, um, going to essentially operationalize it uh, sometime this year, I think. Uh, which means it will not be entirely government funded, but it will be government owned venture funds. So it will be treated like, the funding will be treated like any other how the venture firm would treat, like a private venture firm would treat it. So it's not money that's going to go out of deity, but it's deity is giving it to a venture firm that's then going to provide it. All right, hope springs eternal. Thank you all. And one more round of applause.